the upper is because the first time I couldn't log in and after the first time, I also can't get the thing to uh, project. Um, so, uh, always, it, improvisation is, is part of what you encounter uh, in, uh, in uh, Austin today. Uh, I'm passing around a uh, an attention sheet and uh, I'd uh, like all of you to uh, sign in uh, just so you have a, a sense of uh, so, uh, for those of you who haven't met me, I've met probably most of you, but probably not all of you. I mean, not all of you. Uh, I'm Jonathan Larson, and I'm director of Off Campus Site. And um, what I would like to do with it, uh, uh, this session we have right now is to take uh, about an hour, maybe uh, a little more, to uh, walk you through uh, some different things to consider when preparing for Off Campus Study so that you have some ideas of your own independent of what your uh, programs will be telling you about how to prepare for the, the kind of programs you might be going on and the, the destination that you're going to. And uh, we have also brought some uh, materials for you that uh, you are welcome to take when you leave. I see some students we already have. We have more over there. Uh, something uh, with copies of uh, Grinnell's um, sexual respect resource cards. Uh, a general guide for uh, planning for safe and healthy travels abroad, uh, something on uh, applying for visas, and something on uh, sexual health abroad. And uh, uh, these are you know, just uh, some, some resources that we discovered uh, and thought that um, you might find useful. And um, so let me, um, and we will also, yeah, I have one other resource that I'll, I'll give out to you. Uh, a little further into the talk, it's a kind of pre-departure um, checklist. Uh, so, uh, let me just start off by saying that um, uh, when uh, I uh, traveled, uh, this is after having uh, had a couple of rounds of living abroad and, and uh, going to uh, different places to review programs, I find that I uh, still uh, benefit from different kinds of preparation. So I, I would, uh, knowing this for myself, with uh, also some ex experience through traveling and going to different places, I really encourage all of you to be uh, as deliberate and, and mindful as you can be to uh, prepare for where you're going to be going. And what I, would, uh, what I want to do is to touch on a couple of different categories and different uh, of preparation and also some different questions to be uh, asking yourself. And the purpose of this presentation, as I said, is really to give you some ideas uh, from the perspective of Grinnell's office of off-campus study, things to be considering. But then all of you are also going on some sort of a uh, program, and that program is also going to offer pre-departure materials. And I encourage you to think about the two together. You know, look for places where there might be uh, gaps in what the, the program offers, or maybe some of what uh, I have to say today, you know, it's just uh, approximately an hour. It uh, can't be, it can't cover everything. But hopefully also, when you hold uh, up today's session against some of what you learned from your program, it gives you uh, some questions to ask yourself, some ideas of, of uh, uh, resources to check out. Uh, so first of all, um, if you can see the screen here, actually, you can kind of see the screen here, uh, just in a smaller form. <laughs> Probably a little too small form. Um, but I'll put it up here for reference. I, this PowerPoint that I prepared today, uh, you can um, uh, post it and make it available uh, uh, afterward in both uh, uh, Grinnell Share and, um, yeah, I think we'll be putting on our off campus study site for Grinnell Share. Um, so, uh, first of all, off campus study uh, is um, more than a trip. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, students refer to off campus study as a, as a trip, and I would really encourage you to think of it as going to live somewhere for a semester. You're going to have uh, an address. You know, maybe people won't really send much there because you know, postal addresses are becoming a bit uh, quaint. But it kind of stands for something. That you're actually going to have an address. You're going to have a, you're sort of a neighborhood that you're, you'll be um, used to. You'll uh, have you know develop routines. You'll have to like figure out how to get around some some other place. You'll have uh, a different uh, pace. Like for some of you, that pace might be more relaxed than at Grinnell because you might find that your classes don't meet as often or they don't have as many assignments. Uh, for some of you, that pace might be more intense. 
Uh, we have some programs that are uh, very uh, intensive, sometimes in the arts, maybe sometimes in uh, the sciences, but involves uh, field study. And uh, you're going to uh, you know, have to adjust to some sort of a different pace. So this is a, this is a whole experience. We are also getting ready to take classes, to interact with people in a new place, and to reflect on the whole experience and, and think about how it's changing you and how what you're learning about uh, that place where you you've gone to live. So um, some of the, the different kinds of preparation that uh, I'd I like to think of. Broad categories first. Um, there are general things for you to think about when it comes to uh, pre preparing yourselves. Um, that's what this, this presentation is about. Um, and then there are also are going to be some uh, forms of preparation that are specific to your program. And this is this is why it's really good for you to pay attention to uh, whatever your program uh, provides for you in the way of pre-departure information. Uh, your programs pre-departure information, it can go into much more detail about the location, the specifics of uh, you know, health and safety and the cultural context there, uh, tips on what to bring. Um, so there's, um, first of all, you've got you know, sort of their general things about uh, preparing to go away for a semester, then there's also specific. Um, and uh, we also encourage you to, in case you can't tell, the screen doesn't seem to be working for me. Resources, and then we also encourage you to um, form your uh, to uh, research things on your own independently, so that you're you've got some of your own thoughts to hold up against what you're um, told by your program. And then uh, another sort of balance in um, your forms of pre preparation is you want to be thinking about um, goals that you have for yourself in the program. What do you want to learn, accomplish, uh, create, develop uh, while you're uh, on? Uh, on your off-campus study program. But then, uh, and so those are kind of like big philosophical things that have to do with learning. Um, but then there also are practical matters to be thinking about, like um, what to pack and um, do you need shops uh, or for immunizations for wherever uh, you might be going. To be thinking about um, uh, these broad different categories of things um, and to go a little bit go into um, some detail on what, how you can uh, inform yourself, just to give you some examples. Um, you sh uh, should ideally, at some point, um, sooner than later, and right now you know, you've got things to do at the end of the semester, it's nice outside, so this, uh, this month might not be the best time for you to start thinking about off-campus study plans, but the sooner you can do at least a little bit, then it, it gives you... Um, helps you anticipate some things that you might need to uh, follow up on or might want to follow up on over the summer. So uh, for background research, it's, it's great to do some research on the country itself. Uh, some of you are going to countries uh, that are not really um, uh, represented in the curriculum here at Grinnell. They might not really be represented in the curriculum uh, at other institutions either, uh, even larger ones, like a place such as uh, Bhutan. Uh, So uh, a couple of great general sources of information about, about a country, just for background reading, and also current events. Uh, the BBC, that's, that's one that we uh, tend to recommend. Uh, and also uh, the US State Department has something that it calls uh, background notes on countries. And uh, these are prepared to advise people uh, who are traveling on government business uh, to those countries. And, and so this is the US State Department's attempt to be as, as accurate and um, informative as possible in some sort of uh, publicly available resource. Um, I would also suggest, uh, and if you were, if you notice there, I listed one resource that is not uh, based in the United States and another that is. Um, I think it, it's really good to get more than one national perspective on what to expect about a, a particular part of the world rather than just uh, uh, on any uh, one country's uh, perspective. Um, we also, on Grinnell Share, have a list of um, uh, returned students, like students who've been on um, different off-campus study programs. And um, uh, we encourage you, this is sort of a, a long-standing Grinnell tradition, to 
to uh, check out that list, get in touch with uh, students who are either currently in on that program or have been there, or maybe they haven't been on the same program you're going to do, but they're going to be, uh, uh, but they've been at least in the same country. Uh, get in touch with them and, and ask them for any suggestions that they might have. The, the number of countries out there is just too varied for us to uh, really be able to do country specific um, uh, pre departure orientations with, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, Brunel and London. Uh, you might also consider getting in touch with the um, Office of Alumni Relations here. Uh, there are Brunelians in many uh, interesting parts of the world. I, uh, uh, I just met up with uh, one last month uh, in India and really enjoyed uh, dinner with him. And uh, people, graduates of the college who are, who are in different parts of the world, if you get in touch with them, they can have great local tips. They can also, you know, if they've graduated, they might, might get into all kinds of conversations with them also about like what they're doing with their lives, how they got to what they're doing after, uh, uh, after their studies at Cornell. And then uh, I wanted to offer, something that might seem like a, an obvious um, piece of advice to you know, check out um, guidebooks, either in their, their physical form or online, but also uh, a word of uh, caution based on my own recent experience with the, with the guidebook. So uh, by, I, I like to get guidebooks and suggestions of uh, uh, like places to see and uh, places to eat or places to stay, especially if you're going to be in a country where you expect to do some traveling within that country. And they also provide advice on uh, uh, local health and safety, and, and if you need to be prepared to tip uh, drivers, or if you want to avoid certain types of transportation at certain times of the day, it can be really good for that uh, kind of information. Um, but um, you, uh, again, it's, it's good not to uh, rely on just one source of information, because um, I recently uh, 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 was consulted a book for a, a trip uh, to review program in India, and I was really surprised, that, so I'm interested in language I was, I was really surprised to discover uh, the only thing that they really had in, uh, about languages in India was, uh, you know, they, they mentioned sort of two, you know, they mentioned Hindi and English, maybe. And uh, there are dozens of languages in India. And I was really curious about, like, what's the, what's the ethnic diversity like? Like, where do you find speakers? What kind of language in which part of the country? And there was really nothing about, um, uh, about that in this guidebook. I, I, maybe I'll mention it. It's a, it's a lonely planet. And then, um, and then I found I was curious about Sikhs. Like the Sikhs are a, a fairly prominent people in northern India. And I looked up, uh, like, what does this guidebook have to tell me about Sikhs? And um, it sort of talked about Sikhs in the 15th or 16th century. And I was a fairly living people. And then I, I looked, well, who, who wrote this guidebook? Anyway, I think it's Lonely Planet. I've bought their books before. Um, and I, I look at the contributors, and it's all. It doesn't even appear that anyone was an Indian national. So you know, of the like half dozen contributors to the book. It looked like they were all foreigners who were probably writing from a perspective of just like what would a tourist want to find about, the, about uh, want to see about the country or want to know, and so there, there was it was really thin on providing the kind of detail that I thought uh, Lonely Planet compared to some other guidebooks might might give. So uh, it's, it's worth doing some some comparative investigations on different sources and um, and uh, not just relying on one. Uh, it's also really good to. Uh, do your best to research um, uh, current events. So um, you know, there's the there's the history. There's, uh, there are things to know about getting around. But um, you know, if you're going to a place like South Africa, for instance, it would be really good to know uh, why um, students there have recently been um, unhappy with their university administration. Why there were um, uh, strikes in the fall. Um, no strikes this semester, but uh, there were some serious. Everything there goes ahead as planned. You know, if you're interacting with South African students, it would be good to know like, why um, they're upset, what their, what their grievances are. So, um, uh, this is, uh, I'll just skip over this. You can't see it. Um, the, uh, your professors can be a good source of, of information on uh, uh, some sort of a specific country. I have, if you can see the screen, it would be a uh, sort of a sample reading list. Um, a couple, uh, moving into a couple of challenges for you to expect, um, general challenges that students encounter, um, and this is uh, based upon um, a, a presentation that I heard from a, uh, an organization called the SEPA Foundation, so this isn't just um, what we've heard at Cornell, but um, some, 
sometimes students can have challenges in a, in a place that they um, don't have very much knowledge going in of the, the host country's history uh, or uh, local values or uh, current issues. Um, something else that you should probably expect or be prepared for is uh, a challenge of uh, just your own sense of identity. Uh, and have, have any of you thought about this at all? Like what you're expecting might be a little challenging about uh, where you're going and how program you're going on and how it might be sort of uh, challenging for you in your, in your own sense of who you are. seem overall much more um, egalitarian uh, and where you don't have to think much about um, about uh, uh, you know if you're a woman about uh, comments from uh, men who are passing by but in a place like Spain there, there might be uh, some of that in uh, some other uh, some other parts of the world. Other other um, identity challenges some of you might have thought or that you could imagine. States, if you're, if you're going and saying that you're studying at a, at a college in the United States, you might be asked all kinds of questions about what's going on in the United States. Uh, what do you think of Donald Trump? Uh, like, you know, is he really going to build a wall? Uh, and you know, all sorts of questions. And uh, has anyone here had the experience of sort of being uh, of being in a, in a place where you're asked to you're kind of put on the spot and you're asked to represent like everyone from your country? And you know, and, and represent things that you maybe don't agree with. You've, you've had uh, some of that experience. So that th this is something that uh, you uh, should. This can always happen. Like it, it, it's, I, I think, happens if people are between much uh, calmer political times. But right now, if you, uh, you are from the United States, from a college or university in the United States, you should be prepared for the possibility that people might really debate with you, and you might uh, think of yourself as not particularly patriotic. But you might find that suddenly you're going to find yourself feeling much more patriotic than you thought you were uh, because of trying to explain, you know, some greater complexity you might think of what's going on here and what people uh, there understand. Uh, just to, to mention a couple of other uh, issues of identity to be thinking about, uh, race. Uh, you might, uh, and this can be difficult sometimes to, to predict, uh, there are people who go um, to a place uh, and sometimes feel like they stand out, others who feel like uh, depending on the context that they can uh, sort of uh, play with sort of a, a different identity and how they appear to people uh, uh, racially. Um, for some people, so for some people, the standing out is something they get used to and they can be comfortable with. For other people, it can be difficult uh, to get used to. Uh, sometimes because the, the local uh, population can maybe you know, do little things that can make it uh, difficult to get used to, such as um, you know, your, your hair happens to look different. several parts of the world. Um, uh, so these are a couple things uh, to be thinking about that um, uh, your pr programs will hopefully also uh, give you some locations to give advice on. Um, there are likely to be things that are different, or there actually sh hopefully will be, should be, uh, things that are different than what you expected and that you're going to have to 
to adjust to beyond identity. Uh, just uh, different uh, availability of, of certain things, like maybe when you, maybe it might be when and how you shower. Maybe something basic is, you know, is that the take for granted here. Um, but this is part of uh, a learning experience, learning to adjust that's a really uh, rich part of, of uh, off-campus study uh, beyond what you're learning from, from your courses. You might have difficulty meeting people, you know, figuring out, you, know, you need to develop a different st a strategy and provide a strategy for how you're, you're going to get to know people better. Uh, you might have trouble recognizing or just understanding people's different schedules too, and uh, like how they seem to relate to time or uh, uh, how they communicate. Um, so is anyone going to um, uh, southeastern Europe, like Greece? Are you going to Greece? Yeah. I don't know if this will be. I don't know if this will be true in Greece, but right next door to Greece is Bulgaria. Uh, uh, this means yes. Oh yeah, no, same in Greece. Same in Greece. Okay. Yeah, my grandmother's Greek, though, so I'm familiar with. But okay. yeah, it's, it's so, really so you're all set. But there, there can be a variety of, of ways, like also, like people verbally might be a little more, they might be a little different in how they express that they're disagreeing with you. Uh, they, 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 you know, because of local politeness norms being a little different than what you're used to. So th there is hopefully going to be a fair amount of, uh, of things that you'll need to adjust to, and, but that's part of what is going to be a, a real uh, growth opportunity for all of you. So, um, as, uh, part of these adjustments, we can speak about something called um, uh, culture shock. Uh, does, does anyone know if they have experienced culture shock before? Yeah, you know, we have some connection. Thank you. What and uh, how would you describe the culture shock? I, I went to Japan. I was just, I just, it's kind of a different world. I don't know. Uh -huh. I mean, it's disorienting, and, but I mean, I was with friends. So. And what, what in particular, like, can you say a little bit more about Well, I mean, I think if you go to a place with a different alphabet and you don't know the language at all, just not being able to situate yourself in any way with road signs or to not even be able to, like, convey that you need help because those words, like, for instance, even in Greece, nay means yes. Like, there, there can be, like, ways that you really feel, like, isolated and, and uh, that the culture or the people around you are very inaccessible. Okay. So a feeling of isolation is was quite yeah. familiar. Yeah, kind of. Uh, how about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just an international student, so... So here? Yeah. Okay, for now. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what are some of the, the forms that uh, kind of shock is taking here? Um, well, it's like, initially it's like a lot of like social interactions with people are different in ways that like, you're not necessarily used to. And uh, just like, like a way of like greeting people and such can be different. So I think it's just like important sensitive about other people's culture and try to like be open minded and learn from each other as well as like, try to like teach people like in a non condescending sort of a manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I imagine for many international students, depending on where you're from, like the different uh, attitudes on campus toward alcohol, for example, like that could be as uh, I've heard to do that it's often a real adjustment and that, that how that's a part of how people socialize. So like in New Delhi, um, people at like five in the morning will start walking down the street screaming and it would wake me up. And so just like that day-to-day -day type stuff that for instance coming from Grinnell, like we're totally not used to at all, um, can be not just shocking but like really frustrating and kind of demoralizing at times. Demoralizing too, yeah. So you're, you're, we've, you've hopefully you aren't, you haven't you've considered this possibility before, but maybe, maybe I imagine that some of you have that when you go abroad, it, that it will not just be fun, but you will also experience times of uh, isolation or feeling deeply demoralized by something that you've encountered and you don't know how to make sense of, or it's kind of like you're, you're knowing that it's going to come up again the following day, or you, you don't really see an end to your, your uh, feeling about whatever this thing is that's frustrating, isolating, demoralizing. Well, this is um, the, the good news is that uh, if you bear with things, uh, for many people, they usually have come out of that. Uh, so we talked about there being a kind of uh, culture shock curve. Where you, you go into shock, and then you start to adjust to things again. And you know, it could even be that you go back into 
into some form of uh, shock a little later on. But uh, just like what I was saying a minute ago about uh, you know, some of these differences that you encounter being a good learning spree, uh, I personally think it's, it's a good thing if you all encounter some kind of culture shock because there, there's, there's some real learning that happens there when you're trying to make sense of like, what is it that's going on, why are you shocked, and you have the experience of also coming out of it. Um, your, uh, the culture shock curve also includes um, the people who've studied this have also said that you know, there's a re-entry phase. And uh, from my own personal experience, I, uh, you know, I can say that I've ex experienced uh, things in a re-entry phase. So uh, when I uh, lived in uh, Eastern Europe for uh, a couple of years, uh, I uh, came back. And you know, things there now have really uh, developed uh, a lot, so I don't think I would have the same completely the same uh, experience, but uh, my mother uh, took me to a, uh, the supermarket, asked me, you know, what would you like to eat? And I remember thinking, like, the lights in the supermarket are so bright. Like, did it really need this much light? And like all these, a pile of cereal? Like, do you really need like this much choice in cereal? This is absurd. And I don't know, there were all these things that previously I never would have cared about that I started criticizing. And uh, I remember like riding it uh, with my sister somewhere, and I don't know, things I was just seeing out the window. I was probably more shocked in like returning to life in the United States and there were lots of things that I was uh, alienated from. Uh, so um, you know, be prepared for the possibility of uh, some uh, shock when you uh, come back to the United States. Uh, something that is a uh, can help get you through culture shock, and I just want to mention this uh, concept, is something that uh, you can refer to as intercultural competence. Um, it, and uh, just to give you a very short definition of it, this is on this slide that um, Grinnell shared, you might hear about in your programs as well. Um, it's an ability to communicate and act appropriately and effectively across cultural differences. So we hope by sending you on off to the city different parts of the world that like through grappling with some of these differences and reflecting on them and talking with other people about them, that you slowly learn to uh, figure out how to uh, relate to some of the, um, you know, the people in the locations where you're studying who maybe initially frustrated you. Um, and there are actually stages of developing intercultural competence that different um, researchers have referred to. Uh, they've uh, referred to uh, one stage uh, that might be when you first arrive and maybe you're actually thinking that, uh, oh, this isn't so bad here. Like, everything actually looks much more like I expected. Uh, and uh, the, the differences aren't as great as I experienced. That um, might be a kind of denial uh, stage of like thinking that there's actually greater similarity among all of us. And then uh, perhaps you go into a, a phase of, of, of polarization, uh, of uh, like really starting to recognize some differences and feeling very strongly uh, you know, in uh, judgmental terms about what's good and what's bad about the, the difference of the, uh, in this place where you're studying. Then uh, there might be, as part of this intercultural, developing this intercultural knowledge, you might start to slowly minimize, uh, then accept, and then fully adapt. And uh, people who say this say that, you know, it can take, this is usually, you usually don't go through this whole spectrum within a semester of living in a place. This could be over like, quite a bit of time of uh, uh, returning to a place, learning uh, about a place where you eventually come to a perspective where you can adapt some of the mannerisms of a, of a person from that place. And you understand their worldview, but you actually have you know, moved beyond even just taking on their worldview and thinking that their worldview is great. You're able to criticize like things about that culture and also see in some relative way like what are the strengths and weaknesses of your, uh, of your own uh, culture. So to uh, work on um, your, your you know, like intercultural skills, which we really encourage you to do, um, you know, researching uh, what the, the program is going to help you do uh, and get you out and, and doing is, is good. Researching your local uh, setting, uh, interviewing or talking with people like you know international students from here or students who've been on the program that helps you know, helps you prepare. 
And then also, it's good in advance for you to be thinking about what you expect might be challenging about where you're going, and what, also how, uh, by going to a different place for a semester, stepping away from Grinnell, uh, going on a program that has the particular features of the, the program you're going on, like what kind of goals do you want to set for yourself? And um, there are uh, sort of four or five general goals. challenges and how do you think you'll have to adjust to them? Third, how do you want your experience to change you? Do you want it to change you? Fourth, uh, what learning goals do you have from your program's courses? So, like thinking about the, the program and the academic cycle, what uh, are, is something that you hope that by the end you'll accomplish that you have uh, learned from the program's courses? And uh, fifth, what kind of uh, footprint would you like to be? This is a kind of metaphorical question. Like, you know, when you're going to a place, rather than just thinking about what you want to learn, what you want to get out of it, what uh, do you want the people who are there, what kind of impression do you want to, to make? Uh, are, are there ways that you hope to establish relationships with people that might last beyond your, your time uh, in the program? Um, that's, that's a very important thing to be thinking about as well. Uh, so we'll now. Uh, do we have any, do you have any questions about this, this first part of my presentation before we move into some practical matters? We also will have a chance to um, fill out some questions on a little uh, uh, pre-departure orientation uh, survey at, at the end. And we'll be happy to um, uh, respond to those uh, by email or post them to the uh, I'm going to hand out to all of you a, um, at this point, a um, <coughs> checklist that uh, my colleague Lucy here has helped us develop. And these give you some different uh, things to consider uh, in checklist form, uh, like things to look at and uh, expect to have to prepare for as part of your uh, pre departure plan. Um, so I, I won't walk. Through this, this checklist, but you'll notice that several of the things that I'm going to that I'm about to talk about will touch on things in the checklist. So, uh, first of all, there are some uh, documents that are kind of essential to your uh, to your off-campus study. Uh, uh, first of all, if you're leaving uh, the United States uh, and you're an American citizen, uh, you need a passport. Uh, and for uh, many of you. Uh, depending on where you're going, you might need some sort of a, uh, to get a visa before, and this is something that your, your program advises you on. Um, if you need a visa, you typically need to have a passport first before the visa can be issued, and there's usually a certain amount of time that's needed for the, uh, the visa uh, request to be processed. So, um, I encourage you to, uh, uh, not to delay getting a uh, valid passport. Um, you'll also be wanting to think about uh, uh, a credit card as a type if you don't have one, and uh, a game card uh, taking one with you. Uh, we also, you'll want to take um, uh, uh, evidence of uh, ha having some sort of health insurance. For some of you, your programs give all of you a form of health insurance, like all IES programs give you uh, a health insurance that covers you abroad. For others, the program leaves it up to the student to determine how they're going to be covered with health insurance. And uh, we, uh, one thing we can say is that if you have Grinnell College insurance, that includes a kind of international coverage. Uh, it's my understanding that um, how it works is that you might need to be prepared yourself or with assistance from the program to cover an immediate expense, and then you submit for reimbursement. But um, it does uh, cover you outside of the country, uh, where you would get uh, money for it eventually. Um, on the subject of health insurance, we do uh, suggest that even if your program 
insurance gives you uh, some form of insurance, that you keep whatever insurance is covering you back in the United States. Uh, and we suggest this in case you need to return to the United States. Like sometimes we have a, a student who has a family emergency that needs to come back to the United States, and uh, or uh, there, for some unforeseen reason, a student needs to, at the last minute, cancel plans to attend the program. Uh, and if you'll be back in the United States, we uh, want to make sure that you, um, you have coverage and also that there's no uh, uh, gap in the dates of when your different insurance plans cover you. Uh, and so in the case of, for instance, an IES program, the, the cost is up there, the insurance they're able to get at such a good rate, it's just included in the program costs, and it's worth having a double uh, coverage, the coverage back here and the, and the, um, the, uh, the coverage that the program gives you. Uh, another document you, I would suggest getting is um, an, something called an ISIC card. And how many of you have heard of this? Or, Uh, is this an international student identity card? Mm -hmm. Is that something you all know? Some of you have this already? No. Okay, but at least it sounds a little familiar. So an international student identity card, it shouldn't cost uh, very much money. I'm not sure what the current rate is. It might be $30. Uh, and um, it is something that uh, in some instances would count more than a Grinnell ID to establish your student status. Uh, so if, in some cases, if you're wanting to get a student price for a, uh, uh, a local train ticket or admission to uh, an exam or something, uh, if you show someone a Grinnell College ID, they might look at it and say, what's this? Did you make it up yourself? What's Grinnell College? Um, uh, but if you show an international student identity card, that's something that they have seen with greater frequency and they've sort of been prepared to, to recognize. Uh, international student identity cards are also something uh, that sometimes uh, makes a difference on getting you a student price for an international uh, plane ticket. Uh, so uh, it's, they're usually worth, uh, worth money to get. Those are some essential documents. Uh, budgeting. This is something else to prepare for. Uh, so read, uh, we strongly advise you to read everything that your program has had to say about um, how to uh, prepare for expenses there. Uh, also, if you haven't already, uh, look on the, the uh, section of the Off-Camp Study website that's about, uh, it, uh, it's one of the left items, it says Costs and Financial Aid, I think that's the name of it. It's maintained by the Office of Financial Aid. It provides uh, you with a link to a, a spreadsheet that gives you uh, the total expected cost for going into the program, like including cost of living there, including cost of the plane ticket. And the, um, it's good for you to anticipate those different expenses and also to think through while you're still on campus how um, the office financial aid might be assisting you if you get um, financial aid. Uh, and some uh, programs can also be really good sources of, of their own uh, financial aid if you haven't heard this already. Uh, uh, be sure to see what they have posted on the website. Uh, there are also, and you'll see the links to this when we post the PowerPoint, there are different um, really good online resources for um, doing cost of living comparisons with different locations in the world. Uh, also for helping with budgeting, like if you're going somewhere where you're gonna have to manage your own money a little bit more than you're used to on this campus. Uh, um, they're, they're good uh, online resources for this sort of thing. Any uh, questions about documents with budget?
source of information, for instance, on if a, uh, a certain drug is illegal uh, in the country you're going to. So I know that um, some drugs that are used to control uh, uh, attention deficit disorder, that they're illegal in Japan. Uh, it's uh, or illegal in Japan. So you'll definitely want to, you know, if you're going to Japan and you uh, take something for ADHD, you definitely want to consult with your program. Uh, and often, uh, programs that are used to uh, working with uh, students who brought up different uh, uh, health concerns and have, if something is illegal to take into the country, they have strategies for working uh, with you on how to uh, respond to whatever your, your need might be. Um, any questions about health before, that kind of health thing before we turn to some stuff that everyone would want to do with uh, safety? So, uh, some of what I'd have to say about safety, uh, you might already guess at this point that it's good to research your country, and also any country that you might uh, visit. Your program should have uh, suggestions on this. Uh, different guidebooks should have uh, uh, suggestions on this. Uh, all kinds of websites uh, do. Uh, one uh, source of information about your own health and safety that you want to consult is the um, U.S. Government Center for Disease Control. Um, it's a, a very good resource for looking up a country and learning about what are different kinds of um, uh, like health and safety needs to uh, be prepared for in a certain country. Like uh, if there are it's commonly, uh, commonly forms of uh, air pollution, uh, if there are commonly forms of um, uh, food, like uh, food, water-borne uh, pollution. Uh, it's good to be aware of some of these things, even though they may or may not really affect you when you're in the country. So uh, some uh, people are, are worried about going to China because of what they've heard about air pollution. Um, there are other people who go there and they're fine. I know this is true for India as well. Uh, there, there are uh, students who are convinced about going there with asthma, but they, they end up uh, doing okay. Um, they particularly you know, like, uh, communicate to their program if they have concerns about this. Uh, there are parts of the world where you'll be advised don't eat the street food, as tempting as it looks. Uh, if you eat the street food, be prepared for the consequences. Uh, uh, I, and uh, you can just guess what the, the consequences might be. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, some of these consequences might be something you know, more immediate than just getting you know, sick, and it might take you like a night or a couple of days to recover. But in some other cases, some of the things to think about are a little, a little bit longer term. Like, you have to take certain precautions against um, uh, malaria, for instance, and, uh, and take uh, anti-malarial medicine for the time that you'll uh, be on your program. Uh, so this is just something to be thinking about, uh, look, looking into, and your, your programs should be a good source of information on this, but also the U.S. Government Center for Disease Control is really good. Um, you'll want to consult with your program, this is a little, has a little more to do with safety now, about um, uh, your travel plans. Well, even your, your weekend plans. And in the past year, we've just seen really you know, good but unfortunate illustrations of this where we've had uh, different uh, terrorist attacks in cities where we didn't necessarily have a student studying, or uh, you know, we only we thought maybe we had one, but uh, you know, we potentially had actually more than one student in that city at that location, depending on what a student's weekend uh, travel plans were. Uh, and in uh, times when we're Wondering, you know, you know, are all of our um, students, faculty, staff who are potentially traveling to the world, they're safe? Then we really appreciate that they've been letting their um, local hosts know uh, where they are. Because that's really, it's really helpful for uh, 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 finding out about someone's safety. Uh, so we really encourage you. I think I said this at least once. Uh, you know, cooperate with your program, communicate with your your program. Um, it's good to be thinking. Also about um, you know how you can when you're in a different environment something that you're going to be needing some time to adjust to uh, like how you can practice something that might be a kind of um, relaxed alertness and uh, is there anyone has, has an idea what I might mean by relaxed alertness? Does it sound like a little bit of a contradiction? What? Any idea what I might mean by that? Yeah. What if you're aware of it? Walking around the Grinnell campus, would you say that you're aware but not on edge? Probably not. Probably not. 
What uh, what would be some uh, settings where you might maybe uh, maybe save. save. Yeah. I mean, so at the very least, um, if you're going to a, a busier city that might be safe, like London, for instance, is, just, is a place where you don't really have to worry about um, uh, about uh, you know like uh, physical attacks, or at least until I mean, until recently, it's you know, the increased risk of terrorism in, in Europe. But you, know, you want to be aware of the potential for just like uh, crowds around you, like possibly someone bumping against you, like, trying to pickpocket you, and, and to, you know, sort of try to develop an awareness of you know, that's maybe you know, just using your ears a little differently at a level to like, pick up on things that would be going on around you, and uh, not to be paranoid and expecting that something could happen at any moment, but just to really uh, you know, be aware of also uh, like where other people Anyone who has uh, grown up in a, uh, a city, you've probably practiced some version of this. And uh, if you haven't grown up in a city, you never have. Uh, but it, um, and you'll find that it maybe needs to work a little bit differently depending on where you're going. Because things, you know, some, some neighborhoods or places that might look relatively dangerous might not be. And, and then uh, some that uh, might look fairly safe could have their, their things to watch out for. Um, and uh, I would also say, oh, think about ways to try to blend in a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, one common way that Americans stand out and can maybe then get uh, targeted for pickpocketing is like maybe wearing a backpack, uh, backpack, shorts, tennis shoes, like that's a kind of like all. Uh, like for some, I think seen as like standard issue college American college student retire. Um, so you you. You might want to wear that because that, that combination if you're, if you're male setting because you just find it comfortable, but you know, just be aware of the potential consequences that someone's more likely to maybe like you know quickly identify you as a uh, as a foreigner and uh, someone that they might uh, try to take advantage of in some way. Um, and it's good for wherever you might be going to try to identify like, the help of your program or other things that you, you read and talk to people about. Like what are maybe three things that you uh, the three big things that you might want to worry about uh, in that location. Uh, so London, it might be uh, traffic, not getting hit by a car that's going a different direction than you expect it to. Uh, uh, other places, it might be uh, pickpocketing, uh, and uh, you know, maybe it has more, you know, uh, some places it has a lot more to do with um, uh, just uh, like food and, and uh, water, so being mindful of, you know, if you're eating fruits and vegetables and what the source of them is so that you have them um, cleaned in local water that might be uh, contaminated with something. Uh, so in order to not be endlessly paranoid about different things that could happen to you, uh, try to you know, work with some different sources to identify three uh, main concerns. Uh, a brief word about uh, sexual health and safety. Uh, we have a couple of we have one uh, dedicated to a sure here, and then we also have a um, Grinnell Sexual Respect uh, Resource Card. Um, you, uh, as uh, we heard earlier about Spain, um, you'll find that local norms about uh, you know what might count as sexual harassment or even if the concept exists, they're, they're going to uh, they're going to differ. Uh, local norms on like what's considered provocative or what's not um, uh, are going to differ. Uh, also on uh, holding people, um, uh, holding hands or showing affection in public. Um, some of you might be going to places where it's much more common for uh, men to show affection with each other in public, such as holding hands, than for a uh, man or woman uh, to do so. Uh, but they might be doing so and not be um, uh, uh, a gay uh, couple, which is sort of a local interactive uh, norm. It's good to be aware of, of some of these things. And um, again, your, your programs should provide uh, information about this. Inform yourself uh, independently of, of your program in case there's, uh, you discover uh, that there's something that they need to be overlooked. And uh, know that uh, uh, there are also, uh, well, the Office of Law State Study and the Grinnell uh, Sexual Respect Title IX coordinators are also here in the background as a, as a resource if you have any um, concerns about advice that you're getting from your program or uh, the next thing is actually can be related to your to sexual health and safety. Alcohol and uh, drugs. Uh, so um, uh, some places where you're going are going to be much more uh, you might have much easier access to alcohol, or it may come 
in forms uh, that are a little different than what you encountered before. Uh, so if you can see this slide, um, it uh, gives some samples of uh, different uh, beers in different uh, countries. Uh, and uh, uh, says, and I'm not sure what the source of this is, maybe, the, maybe this number has changed, that the uh, alcohol content in a, uh, in a cup from an uh, average Ferris keg is Someone from the U.S. government has got to be able to save you if you get in trouble. Well, not necessarily. Uh, so uh, you uh, want to be very uh, aware of that depending on where you're going. If uh, you encounter uh, something, you might be tempted to try that the uh, uh, the local penalties to be uh, really uh, severe for uh, drug use in the United States. Uh, and then the Resources for uh, uh, LGBTQ communities in, in different countries, just to uh, uh, know what to expect to, depending on where you're going. And um, yeah. what uh, what uh, questions do you have for me about anything about the public safety?
That's a good question. So it, it, it depends on the, on the, I think it depends on the country and it depends on the, on the program. Um, so uh, students going to London have generally found that they've had really good access to healthcare. Uh, like, you know, the, in general, what we, like in this country, talk about, in general, in, in European countries, there, there's much broader access to healthcare, but sometimes it can vary a little bit how someone who's outside of the system needs that access. Um, you, you know, sometimes the, the, some countries' systems, especially if it's a smaller country, that they, they, for whatever reason, they just might not be set up very well for people who are not part of the system <coughs> and who have outside insurance. And so your uh, program is uh, going to have to be a big source of advice on how to, how to use it. And you, programs know that they have to be able to like, help you with uh, getting access. Uh, I should also uh, note, and I said something about this earlier, that um, your programs also usually have some kind of emergency funds available. So if you need to see a doctor and it's a case where you would need to pay something up front to see the doctor and then you get reimbursed later like by your insurance uh, and you don't have that money immediately available, uh, usually a program, uh, or you know, this is, seems to be a, something that programs expect to So it used to be that you would need to do something now for when you return in January. But uh, th this email that would uh, go out, it'll be... It goes out like in right? January, yeah, over winter break, over before, winter break. if you're going around in the fall, you come back. Okay. And then, yeah, so uh, as long as you're you know, up to date in our uh, records, you know, and if you're going off-campus study, other offices on campus can see who's off-campus, they can generate a list of who are the, the students you need to uh, get a new services in town. Uh, like I, I know that uh, you know, malarial, anti-malarial medicine you can get that here, and certain other vaccines you can, you can get here. Uh, but for more specialized things, it might be that you have to go... You might do the shacks and talk to a nurse and then yeah. do initial follow-up with you and then you'll advise anybody else. Have, have you been to the check? It's also, I should say, that we also have a lot of information um, available online. Uh, either, so we've got the, uh, the off-campus study website, which is one of our students who are at the stage of thinking about uh, programs. But then within that app, app, online application portal we used, we have a lot of information that's broken out that all 
used to be assembled in something called the Off Campus Study Handbook, and it's now it's broken into sections in that application for catalog. Uh,